Okay, we're going to get started. I'm always uh, in favor of starting on time and ending on time. So, hi everyone. Welcome to the last Moon in Technology session of 2016. Uh, we're so glad you're here, both in the room and online through WebEx or the YouTube. My name is Sarpil Bayraktar, and I'm the WIT program lead. I'm also a principal engineer here at Cisco. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, David Ward, today. He's the chief architect and also the senior um, VP of Chief Technology and Architecture Office. Uh, Dave is a special guest for a couple of reasons. I just want to talk about that quickly. One, he's the executive who funds all of this, this program from the <laughs> That includes our lunch, awesome lunch, and the time of our fantastic program manager, Christina Vargas, over there. Okay. My time, as well as uh, Dave makes all kinds of suggestions in terms of topics and speakers, so we can bring in the right topics and really good speakers. The second reason why he's such a special guest today is because he's the first executive who ever invited me to the table in Lean and Speak. And I mean that literally. I started working for Dave about six years ago, and one of the first things he did was to invite me to a very important customer meeting. So I went there, I entered the conference room quietly, sat in the bag, you know, waiting for my turn. Dave looks at me, pushes his, his seat aside, and like asked me to join him at the head of the table, which was quite shocking. <laughs> and introduced me to the entire room. So this was a time in my career where I felt like I was kind of lost in the corporate shuffle, even though I was working on very hard and cool projects. And I think a lot of you can relate to that feeling. You know, you work on something really, really hard, you make sure it works, you don't leave any loose ends. Sometimes you have to work on weekends and at nights, but Usually, we try to get things done ahead of time so there is no crisis. Um, but then you find out that you are not invited to the decision-making meetings or customer presentations where your voice could have been heard or you, know, uh, you could have been recognized and be involved in the next big thing. So for me, Dave was the first manager who broke that cycle. Um, uh, finally, Dave is one of those rare people who have an uncanny intuition and understanding of what technical women really want from their careers. And he has several ideas how managers can help achieve those goals. So I was asking myself, well, what do we want? Well, we want the cool stuff. <laughs> we want to work on, you know, cool things. We want to geek out. We want to be part of really a teams uh, with brilliant engineers, you know, men and women. We want to work on challenging problems, interesting problems. That's why we have uh, entered into the technical area. But it's not always so easy. So it's really cool to have an executive who understands that. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Dave Work. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, uh, Serpil and I actually have a much longer history than that. Um, she was uh, the University of Michigan, and I was the University of Minnesota back, I think, at the first job you've had in the U.S., Serpil. And um, so we've known each other quite a long time, and there's much more to the, the story um, that, that Serpil can tell, particularly of the last six years when we started working together again at Juniper. And we both came to Cisco uh, together about five years ago, actually, just this week. What's today? Sitting there. Five years ago tomorrow is when I came back. Um, so I titled I titled this the Internet of Women in a Fellows View not only to be cheeky uh, because I'm a guy, but also because um, I've been a Cisco fellow at both Juniper and Cisco. And like like many of you, I, I basically fell over backwards into my career. I had no plan on ever going into networking. I certainly had no plan or business to go into management as I don't have an MBA and I, and I go through those types of things. 
But I do um, a whole lot of technology and innovation. And when I think Circle you asked me, or Christina asked me, maybe a year ago to come to Wit and give a talk, and all of them are about technology, and that's really my passion as well. And so my role inside the company is probably the best job at Cisco. Um, basically, if I put the word innovation in front of it, I get to do whatever I want. And the team gets to do whatever they want. And we go hunting, looking for white spaces in technology and problems in networking and our customers' business and in society, frankly, and try and solve them. And we don't necessarily know how. And the other great thing about the team that's been pulled together, I think it's one of the only times in the history of Silicon Valley that so much talent has come together into, into one group. But what's interesting, from my point of view, and I'm going to give almost the entire talk from my point of view, with, um, is that not only am I desiring to be a technologist and an innovator, I also now have several hundred people that report to me, and, and they all desire to be technologists and innovators. And many of them are at different points in their lives and different points in their careers, as well as thinking about the technology and the evolution of what they want to work on. And it's my job to make sure that I've got a list <clears throat> of really challenging projects um, in four-point font, tattooed on my arms at all times to make sure that everybody that I talk to can have an opportunity. And that's my general management technique, regardless of gender, which is um, I rotate towards raw intelligence, ambition, desire, and where somebody is in their life. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a second. And I'll seek out those people long before I go for the perfect CV and look at the, oh, they only graduated from certain schools and that type of thing. Um, I run into more problems with those types of people that I'll talk in a bit than I do, and nothing against anybody who has a perfect CV, congratulations, that was a ton of work. But um, somebody who has energy, ambition, and intelligence, and, de and desire, really fits in well to the type of environment that we've built, because you have to be hungry, fast moving, and thinking about uh, what's going on. So. Moving forward, what am I trying to accomplish? I'm trying to accomplish creating the highest, strongest, and highest performing innovation um, and, and engineering team that I possibly can at this point. I'm only getting older, everybody's only getting older, and I'm actually to the point in my career um, where I'm over the 50% mark. I've got hopefully 20, 25, 30 years left. Um, but in reality, according to normal U.S. rules and labor laws, I probably only have 15 years left. So that means the way I approach my career is, if I'm not doing something I'm interested in, love, and it's not, and it's changing the world, I just lost 10% of the rest of my career. And so, if you get into a project that's three years long, you ju you just lost basically you know a third potentially a fifth to a third of the rest of your career that's there. Now, that might just be my point of view, but I highly recommend that everybody thinks that way because it's your career and it's what you desire to do. And if you get stuck in a bummer project, you know, you and learn what you can learn. Remember, you're working for somebody to learn something and have opportunities, and so you have to seize those opportunities. Anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. What I wanted to start off by saying is um, I was asked by Monique Moreau and a number of other women to write a foreword for a book called Internet of Women, and that was, I think, passed out, or links were passed around. And I do a lot of speaking and a lot of writing and a lot of conferences, and, and have done that my entire career. But I found that foreword to be one of the most challenging, if not the most challenging thing I ever had to write. Look, let's face it, in the last three years, brand new CEO from Microsoft gets on stage for the first time at a Grace Hopper conference and says, Dear women, don't even bother asking for a, for, a, for a promotion. The system will take care of you. And it's just like, are you kidding me? I mean, how could you have possibly gotten a CEO and missed the boats that, you know, that far? Um, but what's interesting about this is that the way I look at diversity is not in the traditional terms that we're in the trade rags um, that, are, that are right up here. It's far too limiting for me to actually manage my team according to just the terms associated with gender, orientation, race, ethnicity, etc., age, religion, because those measures of diversity <clears throat> don't enable me towards developing new technology and engineering teams. And so what I also want to say, uh, just as a preamble, is that there are going to be some slides, but not a lot. This is really a conversational piece. And my entire 
hypothesis and argumentative technique today is to make outrageous claims proven through emphatic assertion. <laughs> and so the whole point is to catalyze conversation. Uh, many would say my entire life is making outrageous claims proven through their emphatic assertion, but that's another story. Back to the point of the talk, though, is that these are important metrics in society, but the way I define diversity is diversity of ideas and, and creating the best and strongest innovation team and engineering team I can. So it naturally requires that I have a huge diversity of age and different ways of looking at the facets of the problem, etc. And that's just the way I've thought my entire career, and so that's the type of team I try and build. Next is that since I've been at Cisco, which interestingly started December 17th, 1999 at 3.15 p.m., um, <laughs> but who's counting? Um, the entire technique, uh, sorry, um, that was a Friday afternoon. December 20th um, was a Monday morning. I walked into the front door of the building, was met by John and John Chambers and, and Joel Byam, walked into the big conference room right around the, the side of the lobby. And it was full of all the Ds and fellows and the CTO at the time and Van Jacobson and a whole bunch of just massive luminators who had built the, built the entire internet. And they're all sitting there waiting for, for us to show up. And there's a few of us, um, many from Michigan, a few from other places, um, old friends of ours. And I had just gone through an acquisition. But 8 a.m. hands me a pen and says, draw us the architecture of the next core router we're going to build. And so the only reason why I mentioned that is the only way you get um, to advance your career is by the given opportunities. Not everybody gets that opportunity. Um, many, many, some of you have, hopefully many of you will, but it's become my entire management technique. Think of managing every individual by the opportunity that they're presented. May not be their exact, their exact current set of skills, may not have been their experience whatsoever, but if they have energy, ambition, talent, and desire, they're gonna naturally overcome anything they don't currently know, either understanding the problem or coming up with a solution. <clears throat> and also the other thing I wanna mention is that since I've been here and even uh, at Cisco back to 99, um, there has been a line of people out my door asking, uh, how can I have a project? Many of them aren't looking for a job, some are, many aren't looking for a job, but they're actually just looking for something to do because their current job is so bad either mucking out the stables of somebody else's buggy code or just implementing the, the same test in some new language or whatever the case is, and they're really bored and they just want something to think about and something new. And then I'm also presented challenges uh, by the executives where I've been called up to the fifth floor of building 10. Dave, we have this person we want to save in this company. No, we don't know who can manage them. We don't know how we're going to get this done. Make this person successful. And many other uh, leaders aren't given that opportunity as well but realize that there's another human at the other side of that, which is, who is this person? What do they know? Why am I reporting to them? And what am I going to do about it? And then I meet people mid-late career um, who fundamentally need or desire, sometimes they know, sometimes they don't, to have to reinvent themselves because the technology and the problem that they've worked on for umpteen years or whatever, we're not going to build. It would be nice if we told people more often and sooner that we weren't going to build their idea so that way they could find the next opportunity. But a lot of folks also need to be told 20 years down the path that that is kind of done and we need you to do something else. And so that reinvention piece um, has shaped who I am as a manager as well. So just a quick background <clears throat> on the senior tech talent. That's what that is. That's what I call everybody roughly principal engineer and up to the highest level of engineering in the company. And it, it maps out like this, or so HR tells you. And this is the rest of the talk is going to be about the engineering side of this, and nothing against people who do management, uh, but I just want to talk about engineers today. But there is something that I want to mention that even in this uh, technical ladder, even though HR, at no matter what company you're at, says you're getting paid and you're an equivalent of a senior manager or a vice president or whatever, uh, in fact, you're not. They're just telling you that. Um, I can tell you because I manage these people, and so I definitely can say that the comp ratios of the engineering ladder is not the comp ratio, comp ratio of the management ladder. Now, that's not to inspire you to become a manager. That's inspiring you to fix that problem that, uh, as engineers, we're leaving money on the table. So I've risen to the level of CTO. Um, it's probably the worst title to have in Silicon Valley because CTOs are they're dime a dozen. Who knows what that title means? It just means that... Um, 
you have longer business cards at this point. So I still um, operate basically as, as, a, as an innovation guy and technologist. So I want to talk about women working in those technical roles in particular. First thing I want to mention is that current social science, and I think everybody understands this, current social science around gender diversity on the technical career ladder is a complete and utter joke. All I ever hear about is the 17%, and it drives me insane. There is no chance that women inside this company who work in engineering, all of engineering, which means reports eventually up to Dave Gecker or Ro Rowan, um, adequately is described by a single number of being any percentage. There is value in having a single number, like the 17% rule, but frequently it's too general, like 17%, or it's too specific, women in biomed in some specific lab, this is just making this for sake of argument, and in general, the p-value of these experiments is so low that you almost have to wonder if it's just sorry, statistically significant on the data that we're looking at. So therefore, I don't think with the current social science and analysis that we've done, we can actually make any concrete conclusions or comparisons across uh, any industries of, of women in the senior uh, tech and career ladder. And so therefore, if we can't make any comparisons or conclusions, how are we gonna make recommendations about how to advance the situation? This is gonna be a common theme, and it was a common theme in that that uh, book afterward that I wrote. So I'm gonna come back to this at the end, but we need, and I would love to see more social science and analysis specifically on this problem, because we're caught in the 17% problem right now. So, talking specifically about networking, it is, I believe, <clears throat> in Silicon Valley, one of the most creative um, uh, arts, sciences of engineering in the history of, you know, of, of building products, technology, and the rest of it. But um, I want to make sure it's clear that creative thinking does not require a penis. And so by saying that, there are other fallacies that currently exist inside the company, which is the farce of meritocracy. Um, the system will not take care of you. The best ideas don't necessarily win. The um, ability to say, that my manager will notice me, I did a great job, I did it on time, and I don't need to say anything because they got it, will not happen. You have to, and we'll, we'll just talk about this some more. So even by the most basic analytics, and the ones that I see because I'm involved in these in the company, is that patent counts, industry group leadership positions, lines of code and open source, um, and just number of check-ins, authorship of technical specs, and then if you also just take a look at job satisfaction, CVs on LinkedIn, um, etc. It's pretty clear that promotion by meritocracy is a complete farce. And again, I haven't done the science myself, but I've done my cursory evaluation over the years to watch how the trends are happening in the industry. And um, meritocracy is not going to get anybody ahead. So being an innovation manager is really interesting, particularly <coughs> in a big company. I sit through the same HR talks that you do. Um, this is my first HR talk I've ever given, so it's kind of interesting. I wonder if it's going to be my last or <laughs> last last of my career. I might have, I may be up to 99% of my career, uh, depending how this goes. But, oh, really good. <laughs> Thanks, Monica. Um, look, the state of the art of HR today for gender, or sorry, for conversations around managing gender and diversity at large companies in Silicon Valley is listen more talk more, be encouraging, you know, talk about work-life balance, and work towards creating a better statistical proof that we have better diversity statistics than we had last year. That last one being the most important. Um, so that's necessary, it's all great, it's, it's good to be a good person and listen in, uh, I should listen more instead of talk so much, but nonetheless, <laughs> it's necessary but not sufficient. Sufficient, and it's often you know, from continuing and continuing to be delivered and continuing uh, in a Dilbertian motion. Um, so instead of managing these things, these, these things are important for me as well, trying to build the highest powered engineering innovation team, but I need the brightest and most creative thinkers who are working on incredibly disruptive ideas, who are able to out-execute other teams while taking arrows because let me be clear, if you're trying to be an innovator and somebody's not mad at you, you have not pushed the envelope far enough. 
full stop. You should be pissing people off, especially intellectually, hopefully, and only intellectually. But nonetheless, <laughs> to be the, the top, the tip of the spear, you also have to do, uh, be able to move mountains yourself because, as everybody knows, people will actively try and shoot arrows at you, destroy your idea through a variety of technical and political pieces, and then you're constantly dodging the way the majority currently thinks about how to solve this problem, view this problem, and then come up with a solution. So it's really challenging to be disruptive and to be um, one of the most senior engineers in Silicon Valley and the education that managers and your colleagues are being given is not sufficient. So let's be blunt about this in a women technology um, conversation. Women are not explicitly managed towards the most challenging opportunities or fastest possible advancement. Um, I don't need to tell you that. If, again, if, if the assumption here is that give me the most challenging job, I will prove I'm the best person for this for this. For this, uh, for this position, and I deserve that promotion, are you being managed to be given that opportunity? Uh, my, my belief is that you should always be able to ask your manager any time of the day, any day of the week, what more do I need to do, or what exactly do I need to do to make it to the next step? And if that person can't tell you, I need you to complete this, I need you to do that, I need you to, etc. if they can't tell you that, time to find another group. Time to find another manager and one who will do that. Now, remain calm when I say this, please, but in my experience, women also self-select themselves away from the projects that may create the fastest advancement. Remain calm. Let me, let me talk about it a bit. So, um, my goal in management is to match talent and skills of an individual at the right point in their lives, and I'll talk about that a bit in a bit, um, and the history of the internet, where we are in technology, you can't be behind the, behind the times, and you can't be so far in front that it can't possibly be used by anybody, and the right problem to solve for the greatest mutual benefit of the company, I have stock in Cisco, I have stock in other companies, I would like, I'd like my stock to go up, and for that individual. That is a pretty tall order for maybe your current manager to be thinking along these lines. And it's a very hard goal to try and meet when thinking about how to manage, help somebody manage their career and give them advice on what you think they can do to find new opportunities uh, and open up more branches in the tree of where their career may go. So it's, what's interesting and what I found working with a number of uh, women engineers in the group is that it's not just listen, it's listen and watch for cues. Because what I mean is that, and again, remain calm when I say this, I find that women are often less direct in their communication and less uh, decisive and instead testing and validating the assumptions that somebody's putting in front of them. And so the end point of what I work towards, of everybody that works in my group to the to best of my ability, is actually understand the person, where they are in their life, their drives, their motivation, their ambition, um, and the kind of, of course, that I wrote at the bottom, how on earth could somebody be a manager, a mentor, or uh, hunting for new innovation without understanding that person to be able to help them manage their career? But it, it is, there is, there are challenges. So there is, there's more to trying to understand what it's like to manage women that, that I've found which is that um, women try and hit fake me. They try to use a tactic of understating their abilities, understating their talent, understating their desires to take the next big project. This is what I found. We can debate. So therefore, I work to build a support structure that at, around that individual because it's a myth and I hear that I've heard this throughout my entire career. You've got this project to an individual. We have no OPEX for you. Build a team and build your build your product. Build your innovation. There's no support structure. There is no chance that that person will be successful whatsoever in that project if there's not full support. Building a team, helping them build a team, helping them select the individuals that should work with them. And the next, realizing that 
hours, communication, sorry, the flexibility of hours, depending upon the time zones of a multinational company, as well as communication styles as you pair people up and help them build a team. You, you are, I mean, many of us are, know, have such a large social network, we realize that there's just fundamentally incompatible pe uh, communication styles between people. And last, when I said that matching up the problem with somebody's talents and skills with where they are in their life, what I'm trying to say here, and I've, I've said this in, in different ways with my team, is that every human being has a giant sine wave, or cosine wave if you like that one instead, but a giant wave going through their lives of you're more productive, you're super ambitious, you're super excited, and this is not a very good time. I've got, fam I've got family going on, time of year, you know, dealing with aging parents, a any of those normal life things. There's a big sine wave as well as everybody has very positive times in life, and everybody goes through some depressing times in their lives. And so that's just a reality. But me as a manager, I realize that. And so when somebody is heading right towards that peak and they're ready to pour themselves into it, give them the most challenging project because they're going to go all in and you better stand back because you're going to get run over if you get in their way. And then the other side, make sure that there's enough of a support structure around them that the project will be successful, the team will still be successful, and things can continue. But for the women engineers I know, that waveform is a little bit different. It's, it frequently is very jagged just because of social, societal expectations, social norms, and a whole body of literature, but I'm just going to try and wrap up in those two terms. In particular, handling kids as primary caregivers, primary caregivers of parents, um, other social and social group things. So it's not necessarily perfectly smooth, and it's certainly not for guys either, but the uh, managing to those points is really key. Now, there's a ton of management stupidity going on out there as well, and I see this certainly in high tech. And the one that drives me insane and is, we should do code complete on December 31st. And I swear to God, um, 21 out of the 20 years of my career, that was a joke, um, <laughs> have code complete and ship, we're going to do this by the end of the year. If you couldn't plan the entire year to have shipment on December 10th, instead of smack in the middle of school break or smack in the middle of all the holidays or whatever's going on, um, you're going to screw people up. And women as a primary caregiver will, i found, will self-select themselves out of those projects, away from those managers who are so stupid that they don't realize that their priorities are for their family and not for a fictitious December 31st date. Now, so, so these two pieces are just create plans grounded in reality. Um, don't have the lead of a project be 13 hours away from the rest of the team if that person has no experience working that way. And never ever get into the situation where we're asking any man or woman, and women in particular, single moms um, most in particular, to choose between work and family. They are going to select family and expect that to happen, and you're a fool if you think otherwise. And in fact, you're a very bad person. They should always choose family first. Um, but let's talk about self-selecting behavior for a second. Again, outrageous claims, um, but nonetheless, I don't think any engineer realizes that if you want to be in the horse business, you've got to clean out the stables. But at the same time, you're in the horse business because you want to ride the horse. Every engineer realizes that mucking out the stables is part of the job, and every job has lousy aspects to it. But the point I want to make isn't that, it's that Frequently, people get stuck in the careers, not only in this company, but in other companies that I've worked for and, and uh, investigated. They're caught in about fixing hell. Junior forklift driver. Um, integrating somebody else's crappy code. Um, and grinding out some old spec and never breaking out of that cycle. And in fact, we take a lot of new grads and say, we're going to train you by doing all these jobs. You just train that individual to go find another job. Um, so, so if somebody isn't proactive and see that this is going on or isn't the role that they want at that point in their life, you can get pigeonholed, have career stagnation. Your talent and skills can begin to degrade to the point where you, you are stuck in that career position for so long that it's very challenging for you to actually break out, even if you were to leave and go somewhere. So, and in many cases, due to self-selecting behavior, 
women have fallen into this trap very, very frequently. Now, <coughs> why? So, why is it hard, hard labor for so long, when I've found women in those positions, pulled them out, I'll call it that, and they have become superstars of innovation technology? Um, it's not that I'm just necessarily a good judge of character and talent, um, but why can't this happen sooner across the company? Well, there's variations on a theme that I've heard of why people stay where they are. I'm just too busy. I've got the, the job is so busy, they, they've just busied all my time, like I can't even think about doing anything else. Um, I'm worried about making work commitments because I've got family obligations and it won't work out. Um, as we continue, any stability and any fear of disrupting stability in the, the, style, the lifestyle they've become accustomed to. And I found that actually these two are the most common that I hear from women, which is that I don't really have the talent and skills for the job. I don't know if I can do that. Probably shouldn't apply. Don't know if I can do that job. And the other one is if I leave this job, I'm going to leave it undone or I'm going to leave it in a state which isn't up to my standards. The second one is admirable. They're thinking about moving. The first one is ridiculous. So, and then there's many in this room, many women in this room who, who work with me and my group where the management technique, and I'll pick on Sangeeta because I said this earlier, let's see if Sangeeta can swim. And, uh, and according to Sangeeta, I'll just for sake of conversation, her CV and resume would have no business for Sangeeta to be working uh, on cellular telephony. I don't even know if that's true, but it's good for my argument. And, <laughs> but right now, the, the, the primary output of her technology is actually going to be for 5G and, and things like this. And what's really interesting is it's saying you did, your, your technology is more valuable over here, figure it out. And so if I was to ask her if it went through, she's like, no, this is perfect for cable. I'm going to stay in cable. Everyone loves cable. Everybody needs cable. And no, it's not going to happen, Sangeeta, um, because we're going to throw you in the deep end in this case. Um, but it just works out. It works out, one, because we're longtime friends. And I know, regardless of the of the situation, she's just gonna figure it out. So let me continue forward. So if women continue to self-select from opportunities that are in front of them, they're gonna reverse their career progress. And not only reverse their career progress, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you can start self-selecting away from things and start self-selecting towards getting, and unfortunately getting pitching hold, it's very challenging to jump out. So. The fear of unintended side consequences, uh, unintended uh, consequences, I just invented a word right there, unintended side consequences, I just want to call it out, um, is a variation of all these symptoms building up into the same situation. So as you probably read forward, the role of every manager, and certainly the technique I just used with Sigita, is to pull them out of the quicksand, start building a talent pipeline, realizing that Somebody isn't just going to learn cellular telephony because I asked them to. You need to give them time and manage them towards the progression of that project. And like with Circle, when we met six years ago, my first day of work, um, she, she talked about her first DDC. My first day of work was Circle walking in saying, I've known you for 20 years, here's my badge. Maybe we should chat about this a different way, Circle, um, on how upset you are. And so she chucks her badge on the table, and that year she's about to walk out the door, and somebody's going to try and do a diamond catch, and you can do anything you want at the company, and I'll make you a project, and here's a few pittance more dollars, or some other thing. Totally wrong time to have the conversation. So get ahead of it. But really the issue is that much of this is following the path of least resistance from talking about engineering. And so it can't be a mystery to other executives at other companies, or even at this company, why so many uh, female engineers leave large companies mid-career, they got caught in a non-advancing role. They got caught not getting the opportunities, not getting the rewards, uh, not getting the rewards because the system is gonna take care of them, and not being selected, and then reinforced by self-selection towards skill and career deterioration. And what's interesting is that that's not the HR talk that we have. So. What is the solution to this? We're in Silicon Valley. Let's go on and have a badge swapping fiesta. 
because if I want a new job and I want to get out of this one, I can't do it at the company that I'm at, I'll go to another company. And it has become part of the Silicon Valley culture. If you want more money, um, go to another company. Now, I did leave Cisco. I did go to Juniper. I did come back. I did get promoted by doing all that. <laughs> but that wasn't the point. I actually never, ever, ever thought I was going to come back to Cisco for the rest of my career. I was here for 10 years. I was completely covered in paint as the router guy. I had built 23 of the world's fastest routers in a row. I was completely bored. And I'm like, I'm going to Juniper. I'm going to go work with the life friends I have over there. I don't want to go. I don't ever plan on coming back. I'm done. Because I was not able to um, ever reinvent myself and do more. And when you're as egotistical as I am and believe that your ideas to affect the internet um, are bigger than a router, and you want to do more, and you want to get all of your ideas out of the internet as much as you can, I, I felt I needed to go to another place. Now, it's, I can tell you the Jennifer story another time. I'm about to go over the cliff. So, um, the, path of re, uh, the path of least resistance in my hypothesis is out the door for every engineer who is caught in these stagnating jobs. And so, this is the real problem for women who face glass or real ceilings and conscious or unconscious bias, in my opinion. So, the experiments that I've run, um, like I said, I've always had folks asking me, please give me a cool task to do and a new opportunity and innovation. And I look for somebody on where they are on the raw intelligence, curve, ambition, desire, drive, energy level, maybe that sign way. But I'd love to see social scientists actually begin to analyze both positive and negative catalysts for innovation and for career movement inside high tech companies in particular. So let's talk about negative cultural catalysts because this affects the way that I've seen women advance their careers and certainly things that I've had to deal with when I've been, uh, you know, as a manager, which is that according to meritocracy and engineering norms, the culture is the best idea wins. Almost the way it should be. We're looking for the best technology. Now, the way I manage it, um, whether folks realize this or not, is that anybody who's in the room, I actually honestly don't really know the grades of and titles of everybody in my group and certainly don't know the grades and titles of everybody across the company. So who's ever at that table immediately is equal in the best idea, we try and find it, okay, or the combination of best ideas. That might just be me. But nonetheless, engineers are naturally competitive and argumentative. In engineering and but from a lot of cultures, argumentation is actually a sport. And it's fun, and it's a social norm to just have challenges of each other. Hey, you take this side, I'll take that side. Let's see if we can't just argue with it. And it's, it can be fun. Now you drag that into the workplace. It's not that fun. And it's not that fun because frequently bullying behavior comes in. And what I've seen certainly at this company and other companies is that the best defended idea wins, which is fundamentally different than the best idea. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that the best defender has the best, has the most wins, gets the promotion. So the bully jerk who happens to be the best argumentative technique by using any social technique they want, making you feel bad, guilt, shame, browbeat, whatever the case is, really bad social behavior ends up becoming the one who's promoted. And that is just, of course, abhorrent and not the way we want things to work. But from my vantage point, that's the way things are working. So as a manager, it's not that easy to ins insert yourself into the middle of an argument, a discussion, a conversation, and select best and non-best. You actually have to know what the hell you're talking about. Many of our managers don't know what the hell they're talking about. Um, and it's not for the faint of heart. So what is the self-selecting management technique that managers do? Page one, chapter one, book one of a multi-volume management uh, handbook set. Guess what the rule is? What would happen if I do nothing? And most of you recognize this as the primary management technique that occurs inside engineering, which is, what if we do nothing? I bet the team will figure it out. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm not talking about. Get in there and make sure that the best idea wins. So what's interesting is that for best ideas, these are personal expressions of the art of engineering, of math, physics, coding style, coding skills, expression in a particular programming language, etc. But we all know that hell has not seen a bigger ego 
than a software engineer whose code finally compiles. I mean, it's, you'd think that, you know, uh, they managed to make the Red Sea port or something like this, but it's unbelievable. So this is all now a self-reifying negative catalyst towards aggressive techniques that win. Those who aren't aggressive um, get caught in technical Darwinism. And the current American trophy culture and our special flowers who were told that they're all special their entire lives, people have become accustomed to winning. Now, what is this result in? results in a destruction of team color culture, and in particular, a team with women on it. Because I found that women don't put up with that shit. They don't want to, and because they don't want to and they refuse to, what do they do? They self-select away from the manager, the project, the team, and in particular, the technology. And that's, that's the big problem that I want to illustrate coming out of that, that particular piece. So, talking, to, talking as a manager, I don't let people check out in meetings or in when it comes to idea forming. And I don't let people escape without actually having received specific instructions on what I need them to do and specific goals that they will be measured against within their team and as an individual. And if women are already self-selecting out of harsh, jerk-laden teams, they're also going to primarily self-select themselves away from leading or managing teams that have a reputation of hostility. There's no way I can talk any woman into ever taking on a horrible, horrible culture team. Um, I'm, I'm making a generalization, but nonetheless. So what can we do about this? General rule. You can have the most brilliant person on the team, but if they're poisonous, they can do better somewhere else. They can't do well on my team. And so a number of folks have found it very, very odd at the level, by title, by grade, by experience, and by um, technical prowess of the people that we've let go from, from the team because they were causing poison. Next, that excuse that this person is so brilliant they can, they can get away with anything they want. Not on my watch. If it's, it's not an excuse to be brilliant, and in fact they're managed out of the group, off the project, out of the group, and potentially out of the company, if they can't find a culture in which they can express their brilliance in a way that other human beings can stand being in the same room as them. Um, anybody, and I, have, I also have another rule, so I guess these are Dave's rules of management, I never thought of it that way. Anybody who asks to be appointed, I, I need to be appointed as the leader and people need to do what I, what, whatever I say and what my architecture is. Take that badge. Nobody gets knighted. Nobody is, you know, suddenly, you are always right. You are always perfect. Everyone will always listen to you. They are always below you and more stupid than you are. We don't play that game. But that being said, I apologize. I don't even know your name, but I was looking at you. Um, <laughs> but here's the deal. Look, being a manager and being a leader is not easy. We're building products here. We're building technology. We have to hit dates. Customers are expecting stuff. Decisions have to be made. Um, uh, and so... This company is, and most companies are not a democracy, and a decision needs to be made. I know that I'll go in and make a decision. Hopefully it's the right one. But uh, it's not always the case. And then the other technique is when your most brilliant person decides to be a barbarian at the gates of Building 10, we're in Building 10, exec CEOs on the fifth floor, and they're going to go around the entire system and just say, you know, build my project, give me a promotion, and things like that. No. Nope. No, that, that, that doesn't fly out of so therefore, extra efforts required in leading uh, these teams, innovation teams and high-powered engineering teams and women in particular. Managers and leaders of teams are not necessarily ones with the best ideas who have all the technically right solutions. Hopefully they're the ones who are the best educators. Be able to fac actually facilitate debates and the communication of problems, solutions, ideas, and otherwise. That leader also has to be able to not only produce and exchange that information among groups, but also speak on behalf of people who don't speak up in the group and fulfill any of those roles. But here's the deal, and we all know this, nobody takes a course in that. And if you're in an engineering program, those courses aren't even available. And, if, and I don't know if those courses, if they were available, actually would be any good, but I know the ones from corporate HR programs are woefully inadequate. I apologize to anybody in HR. Um, and, but what I mean is that some of the most brilliant people I've ever met couldn't explain their way out of a paper bag. 
They can't explain the problem. They can't explain the solution. They can't explain how it's going to work. They can't explain how somebody's going to operate it, whatever the case is. Um, but the programs that I'm picking on to make my point are ones that are the are the big listen talk, you know, uh, that I mentioned before of the of the way that we're taught on how to deal with diversity. But they're really missing the major skills that are necessary to create an intellectually diverse and then socially diverse group of people that are necessary to create the strongest innovation teams and engineering teams that you can, which is um, the skills that engineers just aren't taught. And so the current one size fits all 17% rule isn't, isn't cutting it. So what are we missing? And, and the point here in getting you at the end of the slides is that the, the story that I wrote in the afterword, if you had a chance to read it, and I'll go through just a second again, you should realize you read a story about wit. Everybody should understand that that story was about Serbal. <laughs> I didn't call it Serbal by name because I didn't ask her beforehand, but I'm sure she knew when she read it what was going on. And I'm sure you must now realize after I've gone through this and read through the story of how this was created, that was a story about you. And the thing is, what did I learn uh, going through this exercise with Serbal at Juniper and then here at Cisco is the current stigma of corporate initiatives and this manner and style in which corporate initiatives are generally done around gender groups are either tea parties, nice talks, other things like this. I'm generalizing to make a point. And what Circle decided is, I'm an engineer, I'm going to make this about engineering. And women are going to want to come here because it's about topics that they love and care about and are interested in learning and don't have exposure to, etc. But one of my points here is that gender studies are really missing just the basics of understanding what an engineering environment is like, analyzing this, and it's underserving the topic of women in technology. So what are some of these things that are missing that I think are actually available information? I've got a view into our patents, our specs, our lines of code in open source or even inside the company as well as role grade of women and, and diversity stats inside the company. But in the academia, what's missing is diversity stats about senior tech talent according to the variables that we've discussed today, but also before and after maternity leave. I think that would be fascinating to understand. Um, what, are the, what are the ceilings or the blocking points or things that cause stagnation at each rung of that senior tech talent ladder? And how is there a way for me to express the management techniques I've tried in a quantifiable or even qualified way of describing them in a rigorous manner? There's no, there is no sub, uh, sorry, subtopic of gender studies associated with women in, in technical careers in engineering. And then, of course, what is the impact of, of stresses just in general on that sine wave? and how one manages uh, towards their own personal side web, sine wave once they recognize it, but overall just getting to the root cause. What are some of the root pieces that can be done? Bad manager, company in decline, company increase, growth, startup, size, number of rungs in the ladder, um, management experience, technology, maturity. Interesting, interesting things to think about is some variables that are associated there that I think would be readily available to the science. So, we do need more information. I think that was that was pretty pretty obvious from before. The engaging in honest conversation about male advocacy in this case and gender related communications and education of engineers and the need uh, and the skills that are missing inside engineering teams to make it a, a non hostile place to work. Um, actually, tailoring corporate programs away from potentially delivery in motion into ones that are tailored for engineers and technical ranks and skills and talent that's necessary. And then, by all means, uh, techniques for managers of engineers, because overall the whole thing has to mature. Having been through so many of these for so long that the, what I'm being taught and what I'm being told to do and what I watch others being told to do just really has to mature in general. And the fear of that open conversation will be dilutive in the conversation, or it'll just be a veneer over the top. And I think that would be the most depressing thing to hear about uh, into the future. So on my last slide, I admit I made sweeping generalizations. I only proved them for, through emphatic assertion. Uh, all of my claims are basically unfounded with any numbers whatsoever. 
Um, but nonetheless, the point is here just to be um, getting to the point where we can say, hey, look, the conversation before was dilutive. It wasn't concrete enough of things that we can actually accomplish. And we need to focus on these technical ranks. Now, this is a couple pieces of very strong advice that I can give because the system will not take care of you. And it's number one, persistence. Persistence is the mechanism to get ahead. Persistence in all the variables that you want to achieve, more interesting projects, headed towards promotion, working in a group, working, leading groups, being an inventor, defining, uh, able to define problems, able to find solutions, able to invent new languages, and able to invent new technology. Um, these two pieces, which is you are the best advocate for yourself, and be persistent, and definitely settle for more than you're getting now. So thanks a ton for letting me just go through the brief talk that I had, and I'd like to open up the conversation. So by the way, that as hard as it was for me to write this chapter, coming into this group and knowing that I, I felt like I should have a t-shirt with a big target on the front, and I accept that. And so I accept that I can only be myself, so by all means, any questions, whatsoever that you have, I'm willing to talk about. Hi, my name is Julia. I actually have two questions, if you don't mind. First one, mm -hmm. I wanted to work with ask you to touch base maybe on other technical women careers, because I think when we talk about technical women, we almost always imply engineers, coders, but we forget about analysts, we forget about those who work in DevOps, things like that. So what would be the sample of their career within the system? How would that look like? And the second question I had, um, it's well known that oftentimes, especially male managers, are hesitant in giving the truthful feedback to uh, women, probably being afraid of uh, upsetting them. Um, and I think this problem probably exists with women. So my question is, how do you give feedback to women when it's not necessarily something where you can say, hey, you have to do A, B, C to do that, and that's like, you know, putting a project or achieving something. But when it has to do something more with uh, the skill set, when you feel that someone maybe is not bright enough, when a person is not capable to work independently, or a person cannot ask quickly as others to comprehend what the project is about and become uh, really flexible with that project, but they see others progressing or maybe brighter or smarter, who can grasp things faster, how do you work with, with that maybe are not so advanced, but they still want to progress, they, they still want to grow. So I have more experience with the second question, so I'll talk about that first, but that was a continuum of actually like four questions in two, but I'll let you get away with it. Um, so if I spend the time getting to know somebody and I spend the time understanding who they are, what their ambitions are, what their talent and skill is, and what they're interested in doing, et cetera, et cetera, having a conversation with somebody about um, whether it's a hard conversation saying, you know what, that project, unfortunately, first of all, let me, let me say this, if we're gonna go in and after all of this work and time that we've spent with each other working towards these goals, they already know what grade they're gonna get. So it's, that, it's actually a fairly straightforward to have adult conversations with people about challenging subjects like this. Um, doesn't mean you have to be brutal, that isn't the point. It's just like, you know what, that project didn't turn out the way we thought. Why didn't we turn out? Did we, did we make mistakes? Did we have execution errors? Was it just the wrong way of doing it? Et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole number of different ways of doing it. Um, so those honest, that honest feedback um, shouldn't be as challenging as it is. Uh, fear of upsetting somebody. If I got it my life on upsetting somebody, um, first of all, everybody who knows me actually knows I'm not too fearful of upsetting people. It's that you can't be, you can't be an innovator. You can't be constantly moving. Um, without realizing that there's a continuum of opinions about yourself, uh, even by your employees. Um, but again, it doesn't mean anybody has to be brutal. They just have to be honest, and they have to have had the continuous conversation through the entire project such that the manager actually knows what that person accomplished and what they did. If, if I need to go and give hard feedback to somebody, I actually don't know the project, and I don't know them, and I don't know what they contributed, and I don't even know what the acronym expands to, the likelihood that person is going to respect me and actually pay attention to what I'm saying is very, very low. So I, uh, to an annoying degree, I get into the details of almost all the projects and all the people that are in my group, even though we are in the hundreds. 
I first thought that I'd never be able to manage more than four people, and then there were eight people, and then there were 12 people, and then now we're up to 500 or something like this, including folks. And it just is more, it's more work to be a good, it, it's work to be a good manager. It's easy to be a bad manager, unfortunately, and path of least resistance, unfortunately. So the first one on technical, um, technical jobs that aren't coding and engineering and analysts, uh, I've got to be honest, I think those jobs, uh, so the, the pay scale is not the same for those jobs with engineers. And even though the support function that they provide is as valuable, if not more valuable, than, than some of the engineering roles that we have. And so I think that the, the primary piece there is the ladder is different. It's actually the management ladder and not the engineering ladder. And just summarizing, there, there's actually a continuum. But, but nonetheless, those folks also have to be given larger and larger challenges. It's almost the same algorithm, just as, as appropriate for that particular role. If somebody is a program manager or a product manager, they need to be given a bigger product. They need to be given a bigger, bigger market. They need to be given larger and more challenging projects that prove their capabilities and skills, even if it stretches them way beyond the limits they ever thought they, that they could achieve. And so I would say that the same advice goes there too. I'm Sujata Zoshi. I'm from Cisco IT. Big shout out to Sarpil actually to arrange these sessions and I've been enjoying them. So my question is, you know, women uh, mainly on the uh, networking, not the technology is networking, but the people networking. And we tend to be very siloed. We, we have our ideas. We present it in a, in a very so small forum, maybe to our managers or maybe to our peer group whom we are actually comfortable. But we are not really good in going and selling these ideas to multiple stakeholders. And that's where we, many times we lose the opportunity. So what are some of the suggestions to kind of overcome those barriers? Persistence. Um, so I, I, I understand the point you're making. Um, it's just that we've had so much success getting beyond, um, uh, getting beyond that solid behavior. And the success that we've had is Acknowledge if you're trying to convince your first line manager, and I don't even know who your users is, so I, I'm hopefully not offending them. If they don't get it, you're talking to the wrong person. If you're talking within your group and they don't get what you're trying to do, you're talking to the wrong people. And so through networks like this, you can find the right people who would understand the problem you're trying to solve, the solution you're trying to bring to the table, the technology or the opportunity that you're able to create. Um, if, and I'm not saying you, and I, I don't want to overuse this, but if you're caught in too solid of a business, you need to, to think about whether or not that's where you want to be in your career, or if in fact you need to be uh, tackling a, a, you want to tackle a larger problem. But nonetheless, it, this is simple. If, if you're bringing, if you go to a doctor and say, this hurts, and they say, I have no idea where that hurts, I'm not an arm specialist, you stop going to the arm specialist. Okay. Or you stop going to that doctor right now. So you understand what I mean? You, no doubt, it happens all over the place, all over the time, where you just you see the look, you know that somebody doesn't understand what you're talking about or, what, or the value of what you're trying to bring to the table. But be persistent and keep finding uh, the right folks to talk with through groups like this and other engineering forms, including IT. Hi, um, I've enjoyed your talk. Um, I've been a manager and an individual contributor. A lot of the first times I went back to being an individual contributor, I had this goal that I wouldn't work for a manager who had um, manager skills less than mine. And I realized I probably not really had many jobs. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's helped me as an individual contributor because I understand the management point of view. But a lot of women don't have that experience, and they're not going to have great managers. So what's the advice you can give for how to be successful when you don't have great managers who don't think about this? Well, it depends whether or not that is the place that they would like to be, but they would just like their manager to go to the moon and have another one come in. Uh, have these kinds of discussions with them. Um, so, uh, managers need to be trained and they need to be trained well by their employees. You must understand that because you've been both. Um, if you aren't upwardly managing well, they aren't going to downgrade you as well either. 
And so they need to understand how the team is functioning, what the technology is, what the solution is, and what the needs of the team are. And the need of the team might be for that manager to just go away. Not, not like go away in their career, but just like stay out of the way, I should say. And a good manager will realize that just, um, but nonetheless, it's, it's publicly managing well and training them to be managers in the manner and style of which is best for the team. The way at least I view is that a manager is there to help the team. The team isn't there to make, just make the manager look good, even though frequently that appears to be the motivation of why he becomes a manager. Well, I just pulled that pin and dropped that grenade. <laughs> Hi, Sangeeta. Oh, thanks for throwing me the deep end. <laughs> but a couple of questions. So one uh, seems like we share a pet peeve with this lack of uh, data about uh, diversity on the technical track. Um, because just like the previous uh, speaker, there used to be a software engineer who used to data more to management. So I'll very few women took those up for risk reverse. They moved to the technical track. And so now this is actually has a list of only three types of roles that I have. So, please. so what about Cisco data? Have you asked for data? Cisco to collect data on how that diversity stacks up between software engineer and technical Yeah, interestingly, whether it's um, looking at diversity statistics, statistics or actually the progression of the senior tech talent pool in general, which will naturally pull the, the diversity statistics with it, um, I made that part of my remit. There, uh, and it's not because I'm any special person, it's just because I'm, I'm helping, and one part of my job is to work with creating the, the upper pipeline from tech leads to principal engineers on up. And when you when you do that, you need to look at a whole bunch of different variables associated with that. So the, the issue is that it's actually illegal for me to share a lot of that information publicly. As you might imagine, diversity statistics and the way that we currently have a conversation about it in, a, in society is that you get sued over having conversations about this and releasing numbers in public. And so if, one, if we put up a number, and I put up the 17%, because that's roughly what everybody quotes, and you know, even if that gets tweeted, that's not going to be a problem. But if I put up, unfortunately, if I put up the actual numbers, and Sangeeta, let me just summarize, they're worse than you ever thought on all fronts, um, on what it looks like. And there's Sangeeta. No, but even when you look at patents, lines of code checked in, lines of test code checked in, number of uh, in different leadership positions as tech leads or others, how many people are associated with those scrum teams or agile teams in whatever the case is, um, that's where the 78% breaks down and really is an umbrella which 17% sounds bad, but the actual details are much, much worse. And the opportunities that um, I see out there aren't just opportunities for internal career growth because um, a good friend of mine, Padma, uh, right in front of you, we've worked together at several companies. Um, you advanced your career by also doing external work in standards bodies and things like that. And as you know, Bobby, you're one of the only ones in Sangeet that you do the same thing in, in your field. Some of the only only women out there. And everything I just described here, I think, is ten times worse because uh, out there in the in the brutal external world of, of external specs. But nonetheless, Monica was right. You can pretty much count. It's getting a little bit better, but the reality of the situation is the needle hasn't moved very much, and I think it hasn't moved much. Be, not, it hasn't moved much because of the management skills, the management training, the desire to create opportunities, and the understanding of how to actually manage engineers and to and tech talent towards those opportunities. That that's my thesis. Circle. There's a question of Webex. If you and your manager are competing for the same set of tasks and responsibilities. Considering the manager likes to control most of the deliverables, how do you convince your way up that you can take ownership of your own responsibilities? So when you're competing with the person you're reporting to, that often is a very challenging position to be in in general. And honestly, one in which um, one of the uh, that'll last for a period of time, and it's just not going to last for very long. And that that relationship eventually may have run its course. Now I want you to think about it this way, which is you've learned everything you can from that person. You've learned everything you can from this situation and, and going and, and learning something new may be the right piece. Um, but jousting or competing, and I, I don't want to take competition too far. It's just one word choice that that person has, and I don't want to get too pedantic. 
but that's just it's an unhealthy environment because you shouldn't be competing on the technical piece <clears throat> and on the schedule and the responsibilities. The manager has the responsibility for product normalcy, which is the amount that it, what needs to be built, how much is going to cost to be built, and delivering it on time. That's what a manager is measured against. And of course, the health of the team and the skills in the pipeline. But in the end, in business, it's did this get out on time? This person said at the at the cost that it was going to take. A technical person um, shouldn't be competing. May need to be helping that manager to better cost estimate or provide predictability of delivering those pieces. Um, but I also have been in. I mean, just by the role that I had, um, I also have been in different kind of competition, which is. Um, SVP wanted to go that way with my product. My mic just dropped, no it didn't. SVP wanted to go this way with their product. I wanted to take, as an architect, I wanted to take it that way. Um, in the end, we figured out how we're gonna build that product for the greatest value of our customers in the company. That doesn't mean I don't remind him, you know, every October 2nd for the rest of his natural life that, um, in fact, we should have done this and I was right. But I mean, the whole competitive <laughs> engineering thing comes out in all of us. <laughs> Anyways. Thank you. Okay, I hate to say this, but uh, Dave's time is up, and I know there are lots of questions, so I would like to invite everyone to the um, Spark Room that we have for Women in Tech. If you're not part of the Spark Room, ask Matvey to add you, uh, and if it's okay with you, Dave, some of the questions perhaps you can continue to answer through the Spark Room as you have time. Sure, and uh, what I also want to offer up is that I do get a lot of email, but um, I, the only way that I can understand what's going on inside engineering teams and inside the company is if I talk with people personally. So please don't ever hesitate to reach out and communicate. Email, the Spark Room, Jabber, text, Avian Carrier. Um, I talk to a lot of people and, and really enjoy what I do in my job, which is um, have long and deep tentacles throughout all of Silicon Valley. And that's the way I like to operate, and that's the only way I know how to, how to live and, and be the best engineer I can. So thank you very much for the thank opportunity. Thank you so much so for coming. Next time, you have to promise me I get to talk about technology. <laughs> We've got a lot of really cool projects to talk about. Yeah, thanks a lot. And in January, I have a surprise. We are going to have a Wikipedia workshop learning how to open our account and how to edit pages. And then we're all going to add more women to Wikipedia, notable women. So we're going to have a group from Wikipedia who will come and do a workshop for us. So thanks for coming.